Berlin. Unconventional capital city. Ever changing. And yet forever defined by its turbulent past. Divided by a concrete barrier for decades. The Berlin Wall split the city and polarized Germany into two peoples. A palpable political schism. A symbol of the power and ideological struggles between East and West. The shattered wreckage of conquered Germany is a graphic symbol of the desperate need of reconstruction. After the end of the Second World War, Berlin became the epicenter of a new world order. Divided between the war's victors, the US, UK, France and the former Soviet Union controlled different parts of the city. The geopolitical tensions between the Eastern and Western blocs eventually led to the Cold War. The former zones controlled by East and West emerged as new nations. The capitalist Federal Republic of Germany and the communist German Democratic Republic. At the peak of it, Berlin was one of the most strategically critical places in the world. In the early hours of August the 13th, 1961, the first barriers of the Berlin Wall rose along the eastern border. The concrete blocks put up in the days that followed marked an immediate new reality, cutting off families and friends. In the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. A clear statement of US policy in the wake of the construction of the wall. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev maintained that as long as the concrete wall still stood, Western leaders could not declare victory. But as the Soviet Union's power and influence began to decline in the late 1980s, it spelled the beginning of the end for the Eastern Bloc. The East German government couldn't keep functioning without the support of the Soviets. Change was coming. In the early days of November 1989, East Germans turned out in huge numbers, demanding reforms. On the evening of November 9th, 1989, history was made. Dieser 9. November ist ein historischer Tag. Die DDR hat mitgeteilt, dass ihre Grenzen ab sofort für jedermann geöffnet sind. Die Tore in der Mauer stehen weit offen. And the rest, as they say, is history. I'm Stephanie Decker and welcome to Berlin. When the borders opened, it presented the city with a whole new world of opportunities and also to the people who lived here. And now, almost 32 years on, the German capital continues its process of transformations. It's a city that's been described by many as being in a forever state of becoming and ever being. And perhaps that's what makes it the pulsating city it is today, forever marked by the clashing dogmas of East and West. Represented in every neighborhood in its public space, in the way the city has been expanding, gentrifying, and within its world-renowned street art. The wall may have come down, but the decades of polarizing ideologies and policies that it represented have been harder to break down. What is Berlin today? And have the barriers that this wall created been broken? Is there still an East versus West? On this edition of Talk to Al Jazeera in the Field, we'll be exploring Berlin's identity. We'll be joined by Berliners to discuss the city's anti-status quo legacy and how that's reflected in what many consider to be Europe's unapologetically rebel capital. Thomas Stelmach knows Berlin well. He studied here and partied here during what many would say was its heyday in the 1990s and now is an urban planner. He has seen the city change over the years. So this is 
your vision for 2017 Berlin, right? Exactly, Berlin and Brandenburg. So that was the city itself, but also for the entire region. Focusing on sustainable development, he's looking ahead in how to manage a city that's constantly evolving. And what is uh, fascinating is that after uh, the fall of the wall, the city was like an open playground. There were so many empty buildings which hadn't been used before, and that attracted an influx of creative people that occupied these spaces. At the same time, there was of course also um, a boom expected uh, investment. So there was a lot of uh, buying of property and trying to figure out who actually owned something at the time because even that was unclear in that period. But that economic boom that everybody expected, Berlin as the portal to Eastern Europe and so on, that just didn't happen. Because it attracted artists. And Artistic things. people, you know, new communities, the best clubs and all that, when it became also the, the nightlife center here, um, just because that boom didn't happen. So it was a different boom that happened. And I think that made the city very interesting, even though that was not planned. It, it just happened, mm. uh, which, which is um, a bit funny because right. it's organic. We are planners here, we are urban planners, yet at the same time, that's exactly what you want, no? And an exciting place with freedom. That freedom over the decades has attracted artists, musicians, party people, creative thinkers. Berlin became known as a hub for street art and expression. The interesting thing, it was like a big playground in the 90s. You had unoccupied buildings, you had huge industrial sites that you could work on without uh, problems. So I think there's a lot of people that get attracted by this freedom in the 90s, also graffiti writers, and then 2000, the phenomenon of the street artists is also, they travel a lot and they leave their traces behind in every city. So like Space Invader from France, he left pieces here starting in 2003, or um, Banksy was here too. He left pieces also here, little rats. So many artists came here for that. The street artists passing by, so it's street art tourism or graffiti tourism because the graffiti writers knew, ah, oh, it's easy here, more easy to find space. Maybe less police presence, right. less control. Is Berlin still attracting artists to come here in the same way that it did before? I think now the artists that uh, they get aware that the rents are higher, so maybe there's some less coming. Uh, but it's still attractive because it still has alternative places, maybe an inspiring vibe or something like that, uh, and amazing spaces. Increasing rents and a lack of housing is an issue now facing Berlin, and we put that to Thomas. After the fall of the wall, the reputation of Berlin was that you could come, anyone could come here, live very cheaply, do whatever they wanted. But that seems to be changing now. 30 years later, that's changed. Yeah, it is changing. Uh, first of all, it just took uh, longer. So um, that boom that initially didn't happen, happened later and delayed. So some uh, European uh, larger companies put their headquarters here in Berlin, moved here from Frankfurt or even from London. Very recently, of course, also the Brexit played its role. But Maybe even more interestingly is that this freedom and creativity was so interesting that that became an attractor by its own. So uh, companies, people sought out that environment, even if maybe they themselves uh, weren't artists, they wanted to be close to them. You know, so that were the first um, pioneers and then a bit more mainstream followed. And let's not forget that also all these creative people, they just got older. So they partied a bit less, uh, maybe they married, <laughs> suddenly they have children, maybe they even started a company and now own a record label or whatnot, but it has become a real business and we see that happening now. Is there a backlash to that? Because Berlin seems to be a city that, if we're generalized, are against rules. They don't want more expensive rents. Gentrification seems to get a lot of pushback here. It's also fascinating because it seems there are two uh, parallel processes going on. On the one hand, there's the people here, the, the citizens that have always been in their neighborhood and asking themselves, what's happening? They might even ask, what are these creative people doing here and why is my rent suddenly much more expensive? I don't want any of that. And then 
One could say that recently it's observable that there's almost a parallel world uh, emerging or a parallel system of international capital coming in, the expats, apartment paid by the company, whatever, it doesn't matter, let's just go for it. And so there's a huge gap uh, between uh, these two systems and that indeed uh, leads to a backlash and to conflict at the moment. And we see that, we see that especially here in Kreuzberg, that if there's a fancy shop opening, that the window gets smashed regularly, not uh, because of a particular hate against that uh, store, but just to, you know, to try to dampen the curve if you want, you know, to keep the speculation and the attractivity down. But that, of course, can't be the solution either. Berlin has a very unique history with the wall, east-west mm. Germany in, in general. How do you see that in Berlin? How do you still see that today? You can see it if you know what to look for. So I think it depends very much um, if you are from here and maybe even know intuitively. You can also see it even in the light of the bulb of the street lamp or in the pattern of the sidewalk, whether you are in the east or in the west. Also importantly, there is uh, also a, a kind of um, heritage which is more in the society and not so much in the built environment. So that there are still things or cliches which are typically east or typically west. But maybe if you're a newcomer to the city, you don't notice them. And that's possibly a good thing, you know, that these differences disappear. It's been over 30 years since the fall of the wall. I wanted to understand, does East and West remain an issue today? Patrice Budabella is a Berliner, specifically West Berlin, and TV presenter. How would you describe yourself these days? Berliner, does East and West still matter to you? To me, it actually does, but just like barely, because like some people don't even know. Sometimes it kind of, I feel offended in ways when sometimes I'm like traveling around with people and they ask me, so is this the East? And I'm wondering why would they think it's the East, although that we are in the West. So because they're not really so familiar because so many things have been, been built or renovated within the last few decades. So of course I understand it's really hard to tell. Um, you have some street signs which still indicates in which part you are. It's, it's very diverse but also like very chaotic. And um, Berlin, of course, it's not what it used to be like in the 80s, uh, which is not a bad thing, but we have to figure out if it's a good thing. You remember when the war came down? Yeah. It was exciting. The thing is actually open. Um, I actually lived back in the... Back in the days, like in 89, I used to live in, in Wedding, which was quite the area where Bornholmer Straße when the wall came down. So it was really right across Your the neighborhood? Board. Yeah, it was in the neighborhood. In the west. And, and of course it was shocking to a certain point. Um, and I already kind of felt like, well, I don't know if this turns out well. It did turn well in some ways, but having after so many decades still kind of an issue between like east and west, some and not really talked about. If you just go for all these political um, currents, for instance, you see that there's quite a gap between like what people in the western part of Germany are voting and some of what people in the in the eastern part are voting for. So you can really tell that there's still kind see, of a difference. See, that's interesting. Some people say that there's actually become more of a divide recently, that the debate about the differences in east and west has increased and that it's important to recognize. Uh, other people would say that with time, these things should have should have lessened by now? Well, as I said, for my generation, the East and Western thing, it's still an issue. It's, is it going to remain an issue? No, it's, it, it's going to become something which is a global issue. It's going to be between like up and down. It's going to be between like wealthy and, 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 and the haves have and haves not. Has not. Yeah. No. Sabina grew up in East Germany. For her, Divisions and challenges remain when it comes to East and West. She shows us a picture of her first ever trip to the West, once the wall came down. She's written a book about the generation that grew up under those changes and challenges, her generation. The history always ended in 1989 with the people dancing on the wall and everyone is happy and then sort of unification, Germany, boom, um, powerful country. Um, and that 
but for us, like the East Germans, the 90s were still completely different than for the West Germans. For the West Germans, everything continued as normal. Um, their country just gotten a bit bigger. They had maybe more opportunities to buy property or <laughs> get new jobs. But for us, like everything was upside down. What are the issues these days still that you feel people have issues with being from East Germany, having been from East Germany? And do people still talk in the form of East and West. Yeah, totally. I would say even more than ever. And really? I, I noticed it in myself. I never I never wanted to be an East German. I just wanted to be a German. The meaning of the word has changed. And because you get stereotyped so much, oh yeah, East Germany, you're East German. So you do that. You wear your parents at the Stasi, like at the secret police. Or um, did you have enough to eat? Um, all these sort of stereotypes from the, from the 90s have changed. They're not there, they're not so crude anymore, the stereotypes, they're a little bit more elaborate maybe, I would say. Like, um, you're always in a position to explain yourself and to justify yourself. Because and you're from the East? Because you're from the East. Also, Privatreisen nach dem Ausland können ohne Vorliegen von Voraussetzungen, Reiseanlässe und Verwandtschaftsverhältnisse beantragt werden. Das tritt nach meiner Kenntnis, ist das sofort. Unverzüglich. What happened here just over 30 years ago? This is significant, significant yeah. spot. Exactly. So people were rushing to the border crossings, like within Berlin. Like what this was, this was one of them, and um, they were just standing there, sort of quietly and demanding to be let through because at this press conference they said, um, "It's now." Yeah, right? it's now. As it's now. Um, as immediately. Like uh, so, they were waiting. They were waiting, and inside the uh, um, the authorities, the policemen, uh, the soldiers, they were were like super nervous and not really knowing what was going on and what what they should do and they couldn't reach any of their um, bosses so like around 9 30 I think they made this decision um, by themselves more or less to open the bridge and then people were yeah flooding over into the uh, western district of, of Wedding. Yeah. So, so I still start to cry when I think about it. What does uh, it mean um, for you? I don't know it's like it's like a really big like, event and I'm really happy about that, that that happened and that it was part of my, my time, so to say. The people made this happen, you know, peacefully, like not a single shot was fired. I think it's a big thing, you know, for a German person, we didn't have so many peaceful revolutions or so. So, so it's, a, it's a source of pride and, and, and happiness that day. And I remember my parents being very excited of the so-called, like, not the unification, um, but like something different. And I know it was a minority in the end, like people in the end voted for safety, the Deutschmark, the unification, but not everyone was like that. And um, yeah, that was of course then said when, the, when there was this election in March, it was decided that there would be a, a relatively quick unification. Not as quick as it then happened. But, but did that um, feel brutal? Yeah, it felt like um, it felt like a brutal stop, because then suddenly it was like clear that just everything would be taken over from the from from West Germany and nothing from the GDR was kept. And then with the Nadir in 1990, basically everything changed. You know, even basic things like. When the when the Deutschmark arrives, everything the supermarkets change. You couldn't find any any product from the past anymore. And not that you, one loved these old products so, so much, but it was like a sort of like everything that was home suddenly changed. And in my school, the teachers disappeared because there were these Stasi checkups, and suddenly, oh wow! Um, and no one so talked Stasi about the Stasi legacy remains yeah. strong. Yeah, the Stasi legacy, even after 30 years, <laughs> remains very strong. Now, you know, even now, it it is it is also being being used to um, drive out competitors, one could say. I mean, well, in what um, way? well, if you are an East German and you um, like want to have like a powerful position or so, um, you're being checked. You know, there's a whole sort of chain of uh, journalists who just sort of ask for files if there's anything, you know, on the Stasi file, on the Stasi file, on the Stasi file authority, and if there's anything or it's already enough to have like a, to cast a doubt, you know, that you weren't wow. sort of um, like a super martyr or so. And um, then, you know, your, your career can be ruined. I mean, so many people's careers have been ruined in the 90s. And I'm not, I'm not sort of justifying what the Stasi did. I mean, not at all. I mean, people who, um, 
were informers and, and did harm other people, of course, they shouldn't be in um, public positions mm. or so. But it was also completely, I mean, the whole system, the Stasi informers weren't the bad guy, not just singularly the bad guys. I mean, who were the people behind them? I, I mean, in the party or so, and the whole, um, the whole functionary elite, and they weren't prosecuted. But if you were unlucky enough to had like sort of in your 80s when you were 20, a couple of chats with the wrong person, this could um, destroy your career. Yeah. So, yeah. What do you want your children, I suppose, when they're older to remember and to take away from this and maybe teach their children? This is a, the first generation, I think, where the East-West conflict won't be so prevalent anymore. I mean, when I was growing up, they thought that in my generation it wouldn't be a, a topic anymore, but that was wrong. It takes much, much longer. But um, I want them to know, you know, that Already now in kindergarten, it's just a little bit that they get this, yeah, this sort of East Germany, the GDR was this sort of prison state, basically, and uh, the life was horrible. And I, I just want them to differentiate, you know, be between the state and the private lives and um, just sort of tell them that, you know, it was like much more complicated on a day to day, on a day to day basis and that it's also something to be, to be proud of, this sort of democratic legacy. Do you think your children will be affected still by the East-West narrative? Mm, I think it will still uh, be there for them, but already now I see in like people who are like young, like sort of um, like 30 maybe, that for them it's not such an emotional thing anymore. It's not sort of, they don't have this feeling to justify certain things or to, um, they don't have this, um, this hurt maybe. An emotional legacy that takes more than the pulling down of a wall to heal. But Berlin is moving forward. How did the demolition of the wall affect yeah. the infrastructure and the development of the city? Let's say from, from then until now, until where we are now. Much of it actually has been become an opportunity for development of housing, which at the moment is also sorely needed. This is also a question of gentrification again because these new buildings are very uh, or comparably expensive. And that also means, again, influx of uh, newcomers who can afford these uh, apartments to buy, to own, versus actually also beautiful apartments here, old buildings, old buildings but at a completely different uh, rent level. Right. And all these words are clashing, and that's why you see the graffiti here, you know? So look at that. That is uh, maybe also just tagging. Right but also a statement of let us, as soon as the facade is newly painted, uh, put a graffiti on top because that might keep the rent down I a see. bit longer. You know, let's, let's resist a bit. And the resistance against gentrification is now everywhere in the city where influx of money meets um, old uh, ingrown communities. Right. So that's the same case in Friedrichshain, which was east, as here in Kreuzberg, which is west. Um, so <laughs> that, in a way, is also unification. It's, uni it's unifying. <laughs> a unified in the, resistance, in the against resistance against, against the, money against, and the, against the change and the money. But, but again, I want to um, also say that, in principle, this is not a bad thing. Because, of course, we want the city to become nicer. We want uh, new parks to be financed. The city wants to collect more taxes to maybe build more public transport. So all these things in principle are good. But what needs to happen is that um, the citizens in these neighborhoods are protected from the negative effects of that so that they do not get pushed out or that they can still Is it possible to balance that? It, it is possible to balance that and I think it needs a a careful balance between, uh, yes, the free market uh, building new apartments also for the people who have more money, why not? But at the same time, the people who have always been here to, to balance that and also to regulate that these changes at least don't happen too quickly and that no one is left behind. Mm -mm. I think that's the important thing. You spent a lot of your life here. You went to university yeah. here. You partied, you went into the squats, you were saying to me, now mm. you're helping mm. plan the city mm. moving ahead. Like, how do you feel about the changes and where the city is today? In, in general, I feel good about it. Um, 
because yeah, I have a nostalgia too, and uh, I, I miss some of these uh, old pioneer spirit and this open creativity and, and the, the affordability also. But at the same time, look, um, I don't know, we have a much better choice of restaurants now <laughs> because Very it has important. become so much more international. No, um, we hear all kinds of languages, and and. I think and I hope that this makes the city just richer. Why not have a restaurant with two Michelin stars as long as the dinner is still there, you know? So it's just richer. There's, there's space yeah. for both. I think so, yeah. I think that's really nice. <laughs>